This is going to finish up 2 Corinthians, and we're going to be in chapter 13. So 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 1, Paul says, This is the third time I am coming to you, and the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So you can tell that Paul is a reader of the words of God because he's just always quoting it. And here he quotes Deuteronomy 19.15 which says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, or for any sin, and any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. So Paul is a Bible reader. He's a Bible quoter. I'm sure he read the Bible, or the Old Testament that he had. I'm sure he read it hundreds of times. Paul says, This is the third time I'm coming to you. So he's equaling his third coming to the Corinthians as his third witness. So he said, This is the third time I am coming to you, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. This is his third time coming to them. Verse 2, I told you before and foretell you, as if I were present the second time, and being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. So Paul is saying if the people who are still living in unconfessed sin haven't gotten right, then he will most likely do what he did in 1 Corinthians 5 when he turned the man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. He said, I will not spare. There in verse 2. And in verse 3 he says, Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you it is not weak, but is mighty in you, He's going to prove to them the authority he has as an, as, an apostle, as an apostle. They seek a proof, so they are going to get it. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you it is not weak, but is mighty in you. So they seek a proof of Christ speaking in him. And he says in verse 4, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, he became our sin. He was beaten. He was shedding his blood and he was hurting. He was crucified through weakness, but yet he liveth by the power of God. So, for we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. For though he were crucified through weakness, yet shall he live by the power of God. And we know that he's alive. He's not like all the other false gods. Revelation 118, Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So Jesus liveth by the power of God. In the flesh we are weak, but we live by the power of God. We have something inside of us that made the universe. We have something inside of us that will raise us up at the rapture. Now Paul says in verse 5, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that, Christ, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So examine yourselves, Paul says. Men aren't doing that today. You know what they're doing? They're examining everybody else. He says, Know ye not how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. A reprobate doesn't know if he is saved or not because he doesn't retain God in his knowledge. He doesn't even think about salvation. He's not even thinking about it. As Romans one twenty eight says, he does not retain God in his knowledge. If you are in the faith, you are certainly saved. However, I believe it is taking, talking more than just about salvation here. Sometimes a person is saved. They have believed on Jesus Christ, but through lack of time with the Lord, they have stayed a spiritual baby. They aren't established in the faith at all. And they are still going to heaven, but they barely have more sense than the lost person. There are some things you need to learn after salvation, and you do that when you get in the Bible. Examine yourself. Don't just recognize if you're saved. You also need to recognize if you have any sense about anything in the Bible. So examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. And as I said, I don't just think that's referring to just salvation. It can about be about the other things that go along with the faith. Prove your own selves. Not just your salvation, but prove, 
prove your own self that you're trying to live right. You're trying to serve God. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. So if you are saved, then the Holy Spirit is in you. In Romans 8, 9, it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of us. And this church of God friend of mine said, You're saved, but you don't have the Holy Spirit because you haven't spoken in tongues yet. And I said, Well, what about Romans 8, 9, that says, Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Showing that if you don't have the Spirit, then you're not saved, period. He said, well, I haven't gotten that far yet. I mean, come on, you ain't got to Romans yet? I just always thought that was funny. I'll never forget him saying that. And in 2 Corinthians thirteen six, it says, But I trust that ye shall know that we are not as reprobates. This gives the idea that some of the Corinthians had been convinced by other teachers that Paul and his friends weren't even saved. And I've noticed that a lot of intimidated pastors today are going around calling all the Bible believers lost and telling them not to listen to this certain fringe of Bible believers. A pastor wants to convince you a man is lost so that you won't listen to what he has to say. I can listen to any preacher or teacher, and what he says that lines up with the Bible, I'll take it. What he don't, what he, what he says that doesn't line up the Bible, with the Bible, I won't take it. Now verse 7, now, I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. So Paul wants them to do no evil. This would prove they had understanding, as it says in Job twenty-eight twenty-eight. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. It would prove they had the fear of the Lord if they depart from evil. Proverbs 16, 6, By mercy and truth iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. It would bring them peace if they departed from evil. Uh, Psalms 34, 14, Depart from evil and do good, seek peace, and pursue it. Now, 2 Corinthians 13, 7, I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. So Paul doesn't want them to do right just so that he can appear approved, so that he can appear like a good preacher. Some pastors only want their church to do right so that he looks good. But Paul just wanted them to do right for the Lord's sake and for the truth's sake. Then he said, though we be as reprobates. Even though to some of the Corinthians Paul was made out to be a reprobate in their sight, he was just concerned with them doing right. That's all he was concerned about. In verse 8, it says, For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. He wanted them to do right for the truth's sake. The truth will prevail no matter what anyone says, so you might as well do all you can do for the truth. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong. And this also we wish even your perfection. Perfection doesn't mean they will be sinless. Paul wants them to live like a Christian should. There won't be any of us sinless until we get a new body. However, there is a difference between a Christian who tries their best for the Lord and a Christian who lives for the flesh. We won't ever be sinless in this corruptible body, but we should try our hardest to be sinless. Now verse 10, Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, and not to destruction. Now, sometimes you have to use sharpness with people. I've worked with people who were like that. They don't get the point, as they say, unless you use sharpness. This one guy would give me a hard time every day about something, so finally I had to use sharpness and just tell him that he needs to show some respect for people that he works with. Ever since then, we were friends. On the other hand, you have people that know how to react to kindness. I try to be kind to everybody, and people who know how to act react with kindness back to me. However, with some, you have to use sharpness. So Paul says, lest being present, I should use sharpness. He's going to have to use sharpness with some of the Corinthians because they just don't get it. And he says in verse 10, Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power of which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. So Paul 
using sharpness wouldn't be for their destruction, but for their edification. He isn't doing it just to be mean. This is just the only way to get his point across, is to use sharpness. Sometimes you might think your preacher's being mean, but he's just using sharpness to get his point across. He wants you to do better. Verse 11, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. So Paul knows if a church can be perfect, then they will be in unity. Perfect in the sense of trying their best to do right, and then when they do wrong, confess the sin to God. And he knows the church is better off if they are of good comfort. In Romans twelve fifteen through 18, he says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Wouldn't you love to fellowship with a group of Christians that isn't jealous of what you have, that rejoices at your success, and weeps with you during hard times, Christians that you can trust and not have to feel uncomfortable around them as if they're judging every decision you make. Uh, that's what Paul wants for them. Paul wants them to live in peace. He said in Romans, As much as lieth in you, if it be possible, live peaceably with all men. Make peace and not war with the saints. Now, 2 Corinthians thirteen twelve, he says, Greet one another with an holy kiss. In our culture, we shake hands. I mean, if you kiss your brother in Christ's wife, he probably won't want to live peaceably with you anymore. If you kiss a brother and you're a brother, he may think you're part of the LGBT stuff. So, you know, we shake hands. Not because we're scared of getting corona. That's not why we abstain from kissing each other. It's just, you know, people might get the wrong idea you go around kissing each other. But don't get to a point where you're so mad and angry at a Christian that you can't shake their hand. I've been to church where one family sits on one side, another family will sit on the other side. The whole service, they were judging each other and had something negative to say about each other's kids. It gets so bad with Christians that if they hate another Christian, they hate their kid too. And the kid doesn't have any idea about the situation at all, but they still hate him. But Paul wants them to be in unity. He wants them to be at peace. And he says in verse 13, All the saints salute you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So there you have a great verse showing the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Look at it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the Son. And the love of God, there's the Father. And the communion of the Holy Ghost, there's the Spirit. There you have the Godhead, the Trinity. What do so many Bible believers are afraid of today? They're afraid of the Trinity. They say you're, you're wicked if you teach the Trinity. But it's just basic stuff. But this has just been a quick study on 2 Corinthians 13. And I hope you got something out of it. We'll be starting a new book. And maybe you can get something out of it too.